Well, I'm uh, sorry for the rain outside that we had to move in here, and I really expected to be closer to you. I'll, uh, we have a number of mics here on the stage. I'll try to be very careful so that I don't uh, rumble the podium enough to uh, knock over any microphones, but I appreciate all of you being here on short notice. Uh, many of you, I know, were there this morning at the, uh, uh, at the rally of our, of our students and uh, at their procession to the uh, Office of Student Affairs and uh, heard my comments there uh, as Catherine Bishop is handing out in the audience copies of the statement which I made this morning, which is the university statement. And uh, as I indicated, I think the best way for us to send not only a message to this campus, but a message all across the country, is that there is zero tolerance for this kind of racist and bigoted behavior. That's something we all have to learn, I think, in this whole country. And we're, we're going through the learning process right here. And that is wherever we are, whether it's in casual conversation or in other activities, Anytime there are racist remarks made, we must speak up as Americans if we're going to put an end to this kind of nonsense all across the country. And by taking a zero tolerance policy here at the university and by making it clear we won't tolerate this, these people, as I said this morning, don't deserve to be called Sooners. They're misusing our name. Sooners are not racists and bigots. Sooners are people that believe in respecting each other and helping each other and caring for each other. We're a real community. And I think one of the things that breaks my heart about this is that we have so many students, and you saw many of them this morning. Some were there last night in a prayer circle. Who condemn this kind of activity? These, these values are not our values. We're different kinds of people. And uh, it really, it, it, it's very hurtful to think that our community, which is so strong and so positive in so many ways, is being um, held up by a few people. And I will just say, it will not be tolerated. That is why that house is immediately closed. That is why those young men will have to have their belongings out of that house by midnight tomorrow. And as they pack their bags, I hope they think long and hard about what they've done. I, think long, I hope they think long and hard about how words can injure and hurt other people. This is not our way. These are not our values. This is not who we are and we won't tolerate it. Not for one minute from anybody. So those students will be, will be out of that house by midnight tomorrow night. The house will be closed. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it won't be back, at least not while I'm president of the university. It's not going to come back. It's time we send messages that are very strong and very clear. So uh, again, I want to commend our students. They're the 99% of the great citizens of this university. Our faculty, our staff, and above all, our students who've who stood up and spoken out for our real values, and I, I really appreciated those who came this morning and did just exactly that. They have my full support, and we're just not gonna tolerate this kind of thing at the University of Oklahoma. I will tell you, um, I, I don't really have too much more to tell you um, other than what I said today. Obviously, the video was taken by certain individuals, um, people who didn't, I believe, agree with what was going on. Our students didn't agree, and I'm very proud of the fact that they've helped expose this kind of activity so that we can know about it and so that we can take action. And then I think the only way to keep faith with our students is to take this kind of action. So I view it this way. This is, to me, it's heartbreaking. I think it's heartbreaking for every member of this community the upstanding, right-thinking members of this community, the 99%, that 1% of people through their bad behavior could uh, cast this whole institution in a bad light. We are, in addition to what I said this morning, I've had our legal staff looking at this. I've had also our EEOC uh, people looking at this. Uh, 
and um, we will, uh, we are commencing an investigation, not only of the chapter, because that action's already been taken about the chapter, we know enough uh, to have closed the chapter immediately, and, uh, but we are also going to look at any individual perpetrators, particularly those that we think have taken a lead in this kind of activity. And uh, we, we, have, we have a student code which uh, prevents discrimination of any kind. It prevents those who would create a hostile environment for the education and learning by our students. And it's based upon uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Law of 1964. So we're examining and we're, we're investigating at this point in time whether we will be able to take any individual action against students, evidence has to be collected. That process to stand constitutional muster must be very carefully uh, directed. And so we're, we're, with great care, we're conducting an, an investigation that is appropriate into the individual actions of students to say, see if we can take additional action against those individual student leaders who were most involved in this incident, in addition to taking action against the chapter of the fraternity itself. I think that's, um, that's ongoing. I don't expect that to be something that we uh, can uh, uh, come to conclusions about instantly. I think it's going to take some time. It's going to, as I say, requires great care. And, uh, but we, we are conducting an investigation into individual behavior as well as chapter behavior. So with that, I would be happy. It's a little blinding here, but I'll do my best to see you yes. Right, right. There might be, under, under Title VI, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and our non-discrimination policy at the university is based on the requirements of Title VI. And this morning, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. I have legal staff working on this, as uh, well as our EEOC staff and others that are working on this. So uh, we're investigating that. And there, there is, I told you this morning, I wasn't sure. Um, I'm still not exactly positive but uh, I first thought there was not a way we could. Now I think there is possibly a way because obviously some of those who took leadership roles in orchestrating the chant, pushing forward the chant, engaging in this activity, which clearly is uh, harassing uh, uh, on uh, our community and disrupting our educational experience. And under the, under the civil rights law, it may be possible for us to take action against certain individuals. Yes. Yes. Well, that they are banned as members of SAE from from doing anything that has to do with. I don't know that. I don't know that we can. At this point in time, it takes a tremendous amount of work through the federal process for us to ban them from uh, going to activities. Unless, let me say, we will look at all possible punishment uh, and what is available to us under the law. And I have to say, we don't know yet, but I would say even up through and including expulsion, which is the ultimate ban on all student activities or any activities. So it may be possible that uh, some of those who are most responsible for this activity, once we establish a chain of evidence and once we get legal precedent uh, might be held fully accountable even to that extent. It's early in the investigation, but uh, we're certainly looking into all of that. And I understand the frustration of, of some students, and I first understand how hurt they are by this. And, and certainly um, um, minority students at this university, African American students, students of color are, are hurt by this, and that's what I mean by the need for all of us to stand up and put a stop to any of this the minute we know about it. And then I, there's a frustrating side of it. What can we do? I, I, I feel just as intensely as they do, all of our students. And that rally this morning was a diverse cross-section of the student body. 
Uh, it was not one group. It was the whole university community condemning this kind of action. So um, it could be that some will even voluntarily take themselves out of the university, uh, make a decision to leave the university. But would I be happy if they left the university as students and were no longer our students? You betcha. I'd be happy. We don't have any room for racists and bigots at this university. I'd be glad if they left. Yes. Well, I'm just, uh, I have to say, I don't have much sympathy for them. They'll have to find a place, a roof over their heads themselves. We don't plan to help them. I'll tell you that. As I just said, I'd be happy if they left. So the ones that were involved, I know not never remember this fraternity was involved, but a large number were, a busload, and, and no, uh, we're not going to help them. They're going to have to find a way. No, that's not our responsibility. We don't provide student services for bigots. Yes. What about the Greek system in its entirety? Is there anything that the university can do immediately to be segregated? Well, it's mostly, so you, you say mostly segregated. In the last few years, um, the, the Greek system has, been, has had several uh, students who are minority students. There's a range, and this is the reason we can't paint with a broad brush. There are fraternities and sororities that still need to become more diverse. But there are also fraternities and sororities that have done a very good job of including a very diverse population, uh, diverse in all sorts of ways. And um, so I think we can't paint. Some are doing quite well, they're making progress. Others are still locked in the past and they need to realize that it enriches the experience and the friendships that are involved if they become more diverse as organizations. We've had a lot of cooperation between fraternities and sororities and pan uh, national panhellenic uh, minority fraternities and sororities and doing joint projects and other things. So I do not think we can paint the whole Greek system with a broad brush. But you can be sure that uh, I have asked our Vice President for Student Affairs and his staff to conduct a, a very uh, um, deep study into exactly what is going on. Before this happened, I had been working with the group that is known as Unheard here on the campus that organized this morning's rally to um, broaden the base, for example, Camp Crimson, which has volunteer um, um, what's the word, uh, counselors for our new students uh, to make sure that the counselor core is a very diverse core. We need improvements in that area. We're working toward that right now. I understand there's some very good progress being made. We are working on all the, what are called the campus activities councils. They work with the Greek and non-Greek community on things like homecoming, uh, music concert series, speaker series, and other things. Uh, obviously, we have to have a more diverse representation on those committees, and they're in the bullseye. They haven't been diverse enough, and we need to improve it. We may need to make sure that the music, the speakers, the whole homecoming program is more inclusive, and uh, we're working on those things along, and, along with adding an additional person and student recruitment uh, to try to recruit an even more diverse student body. We're, we're of the major universities in the state, we are the most diverse, and we say that with pride because we think that enhances the learning experience and and, and makes us grow as people to get out, outside our own little boxes and relate with each other. So we're working on all of those things, and of course, a longer range goal toward increasing uh, minority faculty as, as well. And that's a very difficult one, and it uh, involves a lot of identification of qualified applicants and encouragement for them to apply. Yes. President Boren, wondering how forthcoming the local SE chapter has been with information as to who is involved, who's on the side, who's on Not totally forthcoming. And uh, of course, uh, the main leverage I have if they're not totally forthcoming is to throw them off campus. So we've thrown them off campus. I hope they will be. 
I think they need to grow as people. I'll tell you something. If there are 15 or 20, I don't know exactly how many. I don't know what the number is of people who were involved in this, who were, who were knowledgeable of what they were engaged in. Uh, I want to see those people uh, meet with a group of our African-American student leaders, preferably in my office, and personally apologize to them. Uh, they're gone as a fraternity off this campus. And as I said, they're not coming back anytime while I'm here. So, um, but at least I think they grow as people when they learn fully what it means. The hurt they inflict when they use racist terms and the hurt they inflict when they, in essence, close people off. You're an outsider, we won't let you in. I think that, uh, which was the message of that, that, that chant, that reprehensible chant. Well, I, I think they grow as people when they have to look someone else in the eye, not in the abstract, but in the eye, and say, I apologize. I see what I've done. I see the damage I've done. As I said, as they pack their bags, I hope they think about that a lot. And I hope the leadership of the fraternity will come forward and give us a list of names of just exactly who was on that bus. Yes. Yes. Well, I was, you know, today we have a, an incredible event occurring on the campus. Many of our students, faculty, and alumni are involved, probably about 2,000 in the course of the day. We have three, three Pulitzer Prize winners on the, on the campus. We're conducting a day-long session, we call it a teach-in, on the history of the American West in celebration of our 125th anniversary. So you can imagine, in one way, it was a day we were so looking forward to at this university, a great time. This is the fourth time we've done it with uh, leading historians from all over the United States. I was hosting a dinner last night for some of our historian guests uh, at our house, and I was interrupted by a phone call from the Vice President for Student Affairs who had just seen the video moments before. and. Uh, so I got from the table, took the call, and one of my associates who was there was able to look at the video to say I was sickened by the video, almost not able to continue to eat or be a good host because of what I saw. And I, my first reaction was it couldn't be here. It just couldn't be here. This community is so good. It's so positive. That was my first reaction was disbelief. and then. I realized it was here, it was. As, as, as we went on and I called upon the people to absolutely ascertain without, because you never know, you see something, you don't know exactly, you couldn't see right off the bat where the video was, whose students they were. Uh, but we determined that, that it was this group, it was a group of, from the SAE fraternity, and um, I couldn't sleep uh, after that. And uh, when I heard about the rally at 7.30 this morning, I was determined to be there because I want our students to know how proud I am of them for standing up the way they have and for speaking out and for showing the world these, this is not who we are. These are not our values, and we're, we're not going to let that happen here. So um, that's... Uh, I would say I was sickened by it, and then the next thing, I was so deeply saddened by it that it could happen here. Hello. Uh, President Warren, when does this investigation stop? The university being investigated in other fraternities as well as on campus to try and see what's happening with the media? Well, if, uh, yes, we will be looking uh, anywhere there are patterns of behavior like this. I don't know of anything else like this that has occurred, but are others being inclusive? Are they being welcoming at social events and other things uh, to minorities, to people of color, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, we will be looking, and, and again, in that regard, we have to depend upon, uh, and the Office of Student Affairs will coordinate the whole thing. Uh, Dean Stroud will coordinate it with the other two offices, with our EEOC office, uh, and our legal staff will also be involved. But we have to, uh, uh, I talked to a group of students briefly this morning uh, before I went over to the teach-in, but the, uh, we have to depend upon students to let us know about these things. You know, 
One of the things I'm fond of saying to people, and I'm sure anybody who runs a large institution, you cannot fix something you don't know about. So if you know, for example, of instances in which you are not welcomed, or anybody you know is not welcomed, uh, we need to know that. I intend to meet with, uh, it'll probably be a few days, maybe right after spring break, meet with all of the universities, fraternity and sorority and Panhellenic, national Panhellenic presidents and talk with them about this very thing. Let that, uh, we'll be on the theme of let this be a lesson to you. Here's what happens to, whether it's the Greek system or anybody else, here's what happens to, to racists on this campus and to people that are intolerant. And let that be a lesson to you. Now start searching your own, your own programs in your own houses and, and just see if you meet the standards we expect at this university. So I, I'm hoping that the, the punishment that has been meted out already so far immediately will be a strong message to others. I think sometimes um, that's the best way to improve. But do I think there's room for improvement? Yes. Do I think all sororities and fraternities are bad actors? No, I, I know some specifically that are quite diverse and that are, are really doing the, the right things, I think, on, on, on many issues. We'll, we'll, we'll be looking at everything very carefully. And as I said, we already started, we've already started with the Unheard Group. They've been very constructive, very thoughtful. And they have brought things to me that frankly, uh, you know, the days, this is why this is so shocking. In the United States of America, and particularly in Oklahoma, and at the University of Oklahoma, for this to happen in this day and time, a blatant, a blatant exclusionary attitude uh, is unthinkable. But what is happening, that very rarely happens. But what is happening are more subtle, subtle forms of discrimination, more subtle. And we have to, we have to look at those subtle things as well. That's why we need a very diverse committee about homecoming. Is it inclusive or is it not? Really inclusive, such things as even do some national uh, Panhellenic fraternities, for example, who want to make floats, do they have places to store them? Uh, things like that. Um, are we bringing in concert artists that speak to all of our diverse student population? Are we bringing in speakers that speak to the diverse student population? There are all these things that we need to be working, and so we had already started. The irony is, we were, we've been making, I think, in fact, we were gonna have a, another meeting together, it's already scheduled later in March, to talk to each other again about the progress we're making on all these things. And I brought all the Dean's Council together four or five weeks ago to talk about faculty recruitment, to talk about trying to take the, uh, the minority program in uh, engineering uh, to other colleges, and it's been very successful, the multicultural program in engineering. So we've been looking at all these things and we've been making such, I think, good progress and thoughtful progress. And we've been trying to find ways, even in these rough budgetary times, can we find a way? Even when we've been cut $100 million in the last, since 2008, what can we do? And there are a lot of things we can do that don't require money and we ought to do them. And they, they, they require some attitude adjustment. I think sometimes people can also be, um, they can be thoughtless. They can be insensitive and not even know it. And I think part of this is, it's our obligation and we will, we will do that and we're trying to do that now. Make people more aware, make people more sensitive, make people more inclusive. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship that has to be formed. So we're gonna be doing that every way we possibly can. And uh, as I say, I was, have been saying to myself how pleased I am that we've been having such constructive dialogues and that we've, I've gone to the Dean's Council, I've gone to Student Affairs, we've had meetings, these meetings have been good, and, and unheard, my meetings with unheard, uh, my one major meeting with them because they sort of said, here are a group of things that we think you should be working on, and I took that seriously, and I'll have to tell you, I found myself in agreement probably 95% of what they talked to me about. So uh, I wasn't really in disagreement with some of the others, but we just don't sometimes have the financial resources to do them. But, but we're, uh, we're working on all that. And I, 
So I guess you, it just shows that these surprises come to you even when you're trying to do everything you can and work constructively with student groups. And you know, the great thing about it to me is that I don't have to say to our students, bring these things to me, be constructive, understand we have to work through these things. There are no instant solutions. But uh, I don't have to ask them. They come in with such a constructive spirit. Let's make our community stronger. Let's make it better. And, uh, and very concrete, good suggestions. And, uh, and I don't have to tell our students this morning, and not just students of color, but the whole diverse community, stand up and speak out. They did stand up and speak out. So I'm really proud of all, all of our students and, and what they brought to this process and continue to bring to this process. It's hard work building a family. All of us know that, don't we? There are moments in all families. It's hard work building a family. But we're going to build one. We are. We have largely built one, but we're going to finish the task. We're going to keep on keep on working on it. It's a work in progress. Yes. President Boyd, it seems there were individuals on the bus who were not involved. In fact, at least one uh, who was outraged enough to, to, to out this activity. What steps are being taken to avoid any unwarranted guilt by association? Well, we're being very careful about that. And I want to, if you listen to the video, there were women on the bus. Do you hear any women's voices? I didn't hear any women's voices. Uh, and obviously, someone, uh, probably one of those women, outed that activity, was so enraged by it. So we have to be very careful. Just because you're physically on the bus doesn't necessarily mean we can't, we can't have guilt by association. We have to be individually fair to people. And uh, I think that, as I said in the beginning, 99% of our students are enraged by this. They're so proud of what we've built on this campus. And then to have the image of the university smeared by a, a, a small handful of people that acted this out, it, it's just reprehensible. And I can see why our students, they're, they're so angry about it because it, it really holds up something to the rest the outside world that doesn't know us very well and who we are and what we stand for. And I hope that along with writing about how terrible this is, or putting it on video, or broadcast media, or any media, I also hope you'll say, well, it shows how people ought to react to it. And our students have reacted to it exactly the right way, and I hope we've reacted to it the right way in the administration. Well, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know at this point. Obviously, I just learned this at dinner last night. So uh, I don't know. I didn't, I've only looked at the video on a very small screen. I have not looked at the video on a big screen where we could get a better view. We will look at the video and we will determine if there were other individuals who were participating. This goes along with whether or not we can call in anybody individually accountable. I don't think there were enough members of any other group other than the SAEs to hold the group accountable. Now we have to look and see if there are any individuals who can be held individually accountable. And that goes back to the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Just how far can we proceed under that, under that uh, bill? Yes. The university's legacy of racism? Or maybe past history of it. You mean way back before we integrated? Since before I lost Central Fisher? Oh, I, when I became president, I heard, because I always listened to hear as I'm going down the sidewalk, what people are saying in conversations and so on. Not that I'm eavesdropping, I hope. But, but I listened. And when I first got here, I heard um, comments uh, about gender preference or, or race. I heard terms used. And it really disturbed me. And I said, we're gonna, we've got to work to create a 
community where that doesn't happen. And we had a couple of incidents. We had a Native American student who the day I became president had been fasting at the door of the president's office because of a historic teepee on Native American Heritage Week had been desecrated by a group of, of students. We found out who the students were and we brought them to my office. Some of them were suspended from the university. The laws were the laws at that time. We're gonna make, we're gonna see what we can do this time. But they, each one of them personally apologized in my office. There's a group of about 20 students to leaders of the, of the uh, Native American community. Um, that happened. We had an incident in which racial epithets were painted on the car of, a, of an African-American honor student before a big basketball game. I believe it was the Kansas game. It was on national television then, as it was now. And there was a talk of a major demonstration in which our students would go over and interrupt the basketball game. And I remember I talked with that group of students for three hours. Um, it, it turned out, by the way, that it was not one of our students who, who, who painted those slurs on the car. It was an older person in town who had even had a criminal record. Nothing to do with the University of Oklahoma. But a few years later, students came to me and they said someone had put some racial slurs in a couple of the elevators in the housing area. And you know what their reaction was? Isn't it sad that there's anybody that doesn't know what our values are here? And uh, I think that shows the change of, of things over, over time. But uh, the whole society has to change. And, and we've continued to change. And that's the reason why I was so I guess I'm too old to be shocked, but taken aback when this happened. Because I, I, would I be shocked that it happened somewhere in America or several places in America? Um, am I shocked that Ferguson occurred in, in America or the New York City Police Department or other things? No, but I truly felt that all the efforts we've made over the last many years had so changed what is acceptable to say or do at the University of Oklahoma, that it had become unacceptable to be intolerant, to be a bigot, to be a racist, to be someone prejudiced about someone's religion or anything else. I thought we were beyond all that. I thought that was something from the last several decades ago. And for it to occur is just, uh, it's like dashing cold water in your face. It's it, it just, uh, and I think what it does, and what all these things as we've looked in the country, um, they do, they, they make us aware that there are still tinges of racism. I remember when I voted for the Martin Luther King holiday, I, I received about 100,000 letters, and uh, not approving. And I wrote back to all of them, tried to say why, and how we had to be one people, and all parts of our family could, needed to choose people they admired as symbols. And um, so that made me aware that several of them said they changed their mind, I'm glad to say. And I, that's about this incident too. I think at a university especially, moments like these should be teaching moments. They should be teaching moments. And as we and as said here, I think that we have to really think about how we can do better. And so when Unheard was formed after Ferguson, I think might have been the impetus for it, and people began to say, well, I can't change the world, but I can change the area where I am. I can try to help change this university. And that's the spirit with which they came to me. Let's make this university even better. Let's take care of the nuances, not the blatant discrimination, but the nuances too and the more subtle forms of segregation, I mean, of, of uh, uh, racial racism that we confront in our society. Let's take them on. And uh, upon reflection, I, I found myself in agreement with them. Let's, let's do it, let's make progress. And it won't be as fast as we want, 
But we've got to begin. We not begin. We've begun. But we have to continue. Well, I, maybe if there's one more question, I'll take that, and then we'll wrap this up. I know people have things to do, and if not, we. Will. Yes. Um, one or two or three individuals have been, I would have to say, uh, identified, potentially identified, you know, I have to put it that way. We all believe in the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. But uh, I, I would say yes, we have, we are making some progress along the way and identifying some and uh, you never know how this will work out, and some, some may decide to take themselves elsewhere. Well, I hope they do, even before we finish the investigation. It'll be just fine with me if they've all, all taken themselves to other institutions. Just take them out of here, they don't belong here. And uh, I don't want them here. So um, I hope they do, I encourage them. I might even pay personal bus fare for them. If they go somewhere else, just go. And we we are making some progress. Let's say, just overnight, and trying to identify people and talk with people. We have uh, some very good investigators. We don't have a huge number of investigators, but we have some very good investigators, and we're making progress in that. Yes. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And it's a very difficult time, and I appreciate your. Uh, um, being fair about it and listening to what we're trying to do and the action that we've taken. And uh, I hope that out of what I think of as a tragedy will come some good lessons, good lessons for us and good lessons for the country. I hope that will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.